Hey guys, welcome to the Quiver's Masters of Commerce vlog. Uh, I'm Ben, the head of marketing, uh, and this is episode five. And today we're talking about bikes. Bikes? Bikes. Oh yeah. <laughs> make software that a number of uh, great brands use across a number of industries, uh, including bicycles. <coughs> Scott. Scott. Some of us uh, at the company here live in Salt Lake and are big, uh, you know, bike enthusiasts. A lot of people uh, mountain bike, uh, including my illustrious co-host here. Uh, this is Colton Rice, a marketing manager. Say hi, Colton. Big fan of bikes. Really stoked about this episode. So we'll, we'll talk today about the industry, uh, what's going on in bikes, some of the things that are happening, some of the you know recent events that are impacting the industry. Take a look at it from a business perspective, um, and also just kind of of the love of the sport. Yeah, you know, bikes is something. It's a special industry, right? It's uh, something near and dear to our heart. Yeah, love bikes. I mean, uh, I grew up riding bikes. I worked for competitive cyclists for a while. I love a bike screw there. And then we're in Salt Lake City here. There's uh, there's an insane amount of good riding. A few hours south, we've got Moab and Zion, and it's I just mean, like incredible here. Well, it's interesting for, you know, we're looking at bike shops and seeing how they're doing and bike sales in general. Um, it seems like you know we might have expected at the beginning of COVID and all this stuff going on that you know with a lot of uh, retail shops closing that you know non-essential stores you know you were expecting sales to drop off for everything except for like toilet paper and you know like absolute essentials. We kind of saw something emerge with like bikes and skates and other things. It's kind of this category of like non-essential essentials. Right. Like you might think that like bikes are essential to everyday life, but really like people's recreation. Right, and their health and their fitness and their mental health yeah. is so important that you know we actually saw sales of bikes and other products like that go up, you know, and, and are kind of beating the trend. They're they're almost COVID proof, so to speak. Totally. I mean, people are trying to find creative ways to get out of the house. People are moving outdoors more than ever. But the other interesting part about that is not only are people trying to get outside and recreate more bikes, specifically in bike shops were deemed essential business because uh, people rely on them for travel. So their shops never really closed. Well, at first, like they were allowed to be open, but not allowed to have people in the store. Right. right? They, they were... had to do curbside for a little while. Yeah. So there was still a fear that like retail you know, sales would go down. I think they dropped for a little bit, but then it was I like think... a second. Like... Yeah, but we've read well by like maybe in March. Yeah, in March and April, bike sales were up 75% year over year, which is crazy. And then even into July, up 63%. And I think the only reason they probably dropped off is because people are running out of stuff to sell. A lot of it, it isn't, the, it's not the demand. It's actually the supply is the yeah. problem in the bike industry right now. I went into my local bike shop the other day and they didn't have tubes. Didn't have tubes, which is like the most basic thing you need to go biking. Right, a rubber. And it's not that they, like, the brand didn't have them. It was just like manufacturing is just completely strapped. They can't make more. So it's crazy. It's out inventory optimization is like something we need to be looking at. Obviously, we're a little biased. You know, we think that inventory optimization is vital all the time, right? I, I think with you know, you'll have some supply chain hiccups, or in this case, fiascos. Um, you know, it, it becomes even more important that you're doing the most with what you have. Right. Yeah. I mean, being able to connect to stores and even stores to brands that might have inventory, you have to be able to work together to share what inventory you do have. Um, otherwise, you're just kind of, you know, floundering with no inventory anywhere. Skiing and biking specifically are, are sports that people are super passionate about. And I think, you know, that that passion runs pretty deep. I don't think bike it, love is it's like it's that's like, very that's a, that's a thing, right? like, yeah. I mean, not only are people doing it to get out, but people are doing it to get places. You know, it's their transportation, it's their exercise. It's like I mean, you know, you remember your first bike. It's like I love bikes. You I really love, do. Yeah, yeah, I really do. What was it? Do you remember? I had a green Pacific. It was like a Walmart bike, but I loved it to death. And then I just blew it up. I, you know, it was either a mongoose or a Schwinn. This is way better. I'm, I'm older than you. Yeah, it was like, no, it's a little little blue bike with training wheels, man. I, yeah, I actually, you know, I, I have a scar from that bike 
literal Dude, real scar. Have you seen my legs? This is nasty. This is one of my only scars and Put that's that away. That's for me. <laughs> that's for me when I was like 5 years old bobbing down a little hill and like eating it into the gravel road and like a piece of gravel stuck in my leg. And this was back, my dad's a doctor, but like this was still back when like parents were chill. And like, I don't even think we cleaned it out. And so yeah. like the gravel kind of just healed in my leg for a while. The only reason yeah. I have a beard is because I'm covering up a scar on my yeah. chin from, Bike, from biking. Bike so. scars. Yeah. You know? On the other side, while demand is up and, and, and that's a great thing, this supply chain issue is really quite an ordeal, right? I mean, we're For seeing sure. uh, they're just out of everything. Mean, chain stores, Walmart, small bike shops. Oh yeah. Like, uh, you know, the factories have just gotten hit. Yeah, I mean, I was in Walmart the other day and usually they have those like big hanging racks full of bikes. There was maybe two little kids bikes yeah. there. It was nuts. No floor pumps, no helmets. It was insane. Yeah, I mean, it's and it's on e-com side too, right? I mean, you go online and you shop around and like, you know, everything's gone. Everything's on back order. For sure. You know. Yeah, I mean, you might be able to find an XL mountain bike, but everything else sold out. Well, yeah, the supply chain will come back, the time will pass, and the factory will turn back on, and then the question becomes, you know, what's next, right? Like, how how, do, how does everyone move forward from this? Yeah, I think uh, I think you know, really we. We're talking about inventory optimization here. You know, when we get that supply back, being able to work, you know, retailer and brand working together to share their inventory, creating this kind of endless aisle experience that we've been talking about is huge. Well, it, I mean, it speaks to the fact that it's training a different consumer behavior. Consumers were already in most industries really starting to purchase online, right? And that was growing. I think the bike industry was a little reluctant, you know, to get into e-com as much because they still, the IBDs matter, being in store matters. A lot of people want to buy bikes physically in store. But with with COVID, I mean, I think I think you did see even more people push to e-commerce. And you know, it, it just, it's, you're training that behavior in them. So, I mean, we hear all the time, right? Like you can't, you can't sell bikes well online, like full bikes. Yeah. But with accessories, yeah. helmets and gloves and parts, you know, maybe this is a, a kind of tipping point where people go even, you know, all in on parts and accessories on e -com and then have a strategy to like, you know, move that more and, and do uh, like cross sell upsell in store. Yeah, I mean, the bike industry is really interesting. I mean, you pretty much always have to have boots on the ground somewhere. Um, Absolutely. You know, you can sell accessories and, you know, most things online, but what, you know, what we've found is that buying a bicycle is a pretty personal experience. It's almost like buying a car. We talked to Andre, we'll see that later, but it's a big purchase and people want to have that human interaction. And the, the you know, bikes can be sold online. We've seen it happen, but it happens, you know, on the ground first. There's reps out there, there's demo days, there's all this other stuff. And so... It's so a hybrid, it's a hybrid experience, right? Everyone it's has a, to work together. Well, that's, I mean, obviously our software, you know, what we're trying to do is help brands, you know, take e-commerce more seriously and sell products on their website. And like, the tra like have the transaction happen on the website and then the fulfillment of that order yeah. gets routed out to a dealer and then the dealer fulfills it. So like with bikes, you might not buy a bike online and fulfill it out and the, and the IBD, you know, pick pack a whole bike and ship it. Like that might not be ideal, but with all this other stuff, you know, with all the other parts and accessories, you know, it, it seems like maybe the IBDs didn't want to really have a role as a fulfiller for a brand for a while, but maybe they're catching on that like, hey, there's a lot of profit to be made if we partner with brands and partner with their e-com websites or even the retail stores fire up their own, you know, the IBDs fire up their own retail websites. Selling a lot of this stuff online, you know, can be very, very profitable and be, I think it kind of, it, it, 
it, it, it's an increase in incremental sales across the board. It's not like one cannibalizing the other. Right. Yeah, it's not retail versus brands. It's it's both it's working never, together. Right? It's not retailers versus brands anymore. No. Like that's so... It's an antiquated way to think of selling online. Um, working with retailers is essential, especially, you know, it, bike's a really interesting industry, but I, I feel like, you know, if you send a consumer into any store, whether it's, you know, bikes or not, without making a purchase, you've just wasted all that marketing dollars exposing them to so many other brands. So why not just capture it online first and let them go to the store? Yeah, you know that you're like hit the nail on the head, right? I mean, we all want to move traffic into retail stores, but the problem is like, it, it's, it's gotten harder and harder, right? I mean, foot traffic has gone down. It might've come up a little bit, you know, with COVID and people trying to find the last bike item. So they're out driving around trying to find it. Yeah. But a lot of consumers, they don't get out, even in a thing where you want to go see and drive a bike. We, we admit you gotta, you gotta be in store, but still it is traffic down. They're not in store as much as they used to be across the board. So, you know, the dealer locators are like, you're going to go on and, and find it and make them drive out and like find a local store to like buy some gloves they might just not make that purchase, yeah. right? And then the problem always exists, even if you do drive them from their, their website out to the IBD to look at those gloves, they're gonna, they haven't bought anything yet. Yeah. They haven't bought a fo pair of Fox gloves. They're coming in cold. There's no transactions taking place. They're not even a Fox customer yet. And they see all these other gloves lined up on the shelf. It's a retailer doing what retailers do. No problem with retailers. It's just from a brand's perspective, you know, they, yeah. They're on your site with intent. They are looking at this pair of Scott gloves. They've got it in their mind. You're the only brand in front of them. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they're in a retail store with their wallet out. Maybe there's a 50% off on the gloves next door. I mean, on the gloves ne on the shelf next to them and they buy that instead. Yeah. It's never been, it's never been an ideal buying situation. Well, too, you know, when we talked to, um, Bart Miller over at Climate, he said, merchandising in these stores is getting so good. Like you go in there and everything is beautiful. So if you send a consumer in there before they're obligated to pick up, you know, something that they purchased, like if they go in there just with a wad of cash and they haven't, they have no brand loyalty, yeah. they go in, they're like, okay, they have gloves here. There's 10 different brands of gloves. Well, that brand fluidity is up. Right. I mean, yeah. you could say it loyalty's down, fluidity's up, positive, negative way of spinning it. But in reality, yeah, I think consumers are quicker to change brands these days. So, I guess so if you're if you're in store playing the merchandising game, it's really competitive. Yeah. You, know, you're, you do have an advantage when you have someone on your website. You could go in there and, and these shops could be incentivized to push a certain brand too. So like a consumer yeah, you got your goes dealer in there. contracts and all the other yeah. stuff that goes on. The, the you know. sales the salespeople could sell you something completely different if you go in looking for a certain item they could be like well what about this item guess what brand just lost the sale but again we want to support retailers right right so again that's, they make the sale either way that's what quivers is a new ver it, 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 it you know it's superior to trying to push foot traffic off a website to a physical store you're literally taking the transaction right then and there yeah but then routing the order so the store gets the order anyway and they're going to get a you know percent of sale uh, right. a very healthy one, yeah. right because they're fulfilling the order yeah. all our retailers on the platform love it right we're essentially just making sure that your brand gets the, the sale. sale happens and yeah. the retailer gets the sale the, the retailer your gets, brand the sale. gets the sale and the retailer everybody gets the sale we're just making sure the consumer buys your product yeah. and the consumer buys you know the product that's in front of them your brand all your brand marketing dollars go to work you know, you yeah. make the most. Otherwise, you're just letting them loose into the wild and you, who knows what's going to happen. Well, hopefully, you know, uh, if you guys are out there and you're a brand, um, you know, you should really take this fulfilled by retailer stuff seriously. Work with your retailers, not against them, right? Like, let them fulfill for you. And if you're an IBD, you know, please, you know, take seriously the idea of fulfilling on, uh, you know, for on a brand's behalf. Um, you, you come speak to us, come speak to some of our current retailers on the platform. Um, it's a really profitable venue and uh, it can work out really well for you guys. Yeah, fulfillment by retailer is a really interesting thing and it's a great tool. And what we're seeing is that it really de-risks inventory. And the reason behind that is with different channels for these retailers um, to be able to move inventory, they're able to sell more, obviously. And then 
reps are also pretty stoked because when they're talking to these um, independent bike dealers, they they can sell in more product because these shops are less scared of moving their product because now they can fulfill orders that are being made on the brand's website. Yeah, that's a lot of the ROI for us, right? Is we found that like when you when you let retailers fulfill e-commerce orders, you know, they it does de-risk it. They can hold more, and we usually see a lift on the wholesale side, right? There actually there's a, a wholesale lift as a result of dealer fulfilled commerce. Yeah, they feel more comfortable buying more product because they have more ways to move it now. Eventually too, down the road, what we've seen is a serious stockroom expansion. Uh, they, they're kind of able to, you know, they ha expand their stockroom because they're able to move so much more product to filling these online orders for brands. And that allows them to, instead of really pushing sales in store, since now they're making sales online as well, they can really focus on creating like a really awesome customer experience in the front of the store. Instead yeah. of really focusing on selling that item, they can just really be more of a showroom. Yeah. We're seeing this idea of the back of room being a, like a mini fulfillment center. Yeah. Like these kind of distributed fulfillment centers is becoming a real thing and they're growing, mm -hmm. right? The, 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 the stock is growing over time as they realize that can be a very profitable, I mean, we've said it before, we've got retailers who are basically like, they're already in the black each month just from online. fulfillment, just for fulfilling online orders yeah. alone before yeah. any of their other for retail sure. sales. It takes the pressure is, off of selling in the store. You know, they can just provide a really awesome consumer experience and not have to worry about, you know, making their buck like right in front of the store. No, exactly. It's like exactly what you said. The, the, the front of store can be this showrooming experience that they don't have to you know, stress as much about the profitability, you know, of that aspect of the business that the showroom itself and the foot traffic, you know, that doesn't have to keep them afloat, yeah. right? That can be this pure experience play that brings people in, right? That leads to future purchases, yeah. whether it's online or offline. Yeah. So brands are stoked. They're, they're selling more wholesale, a lot more wholesale. Reps are definitely stoked. Takes a lot of uh, pressure off of them. It's a great they're selling point. For yeah. your reps, right? To yeah. increase the account. Like yes. Yeah. And we've heard that reps are, are having kind of a tough time getting people to buy in right now. So yes. it, assuring retailers that they are going to be able to move this product with support from the brand. And then retailers are obviously stoked because they have another revenue channel that they wouldn't otherwise have access to. Go brands. Fulfillment by retailer. Go retailers. Let's go ride some bikes. Let's do it. Andre Shumatov. Andre's um, had a number of different positions. A while back, you were the director of marketing for Flint Digital. You also managed the tech stack for SIA, the Snow Sports Industries of America. You were principal director for Digital Marketing Associates. Tell us a little bit about Park City Bike Demos and, and how that was like a pretty unique business model for retail and bikes. I think it was like 08 is that I truly fell in love with bikes. And then I started my agency, Digital Marketing Associates, and I just really, really wanted to do something with bikes. Mm -hmm. So somebody came to us with the idea of, let's do skis on the run or ski butlers, but for bikes. And that guy wanted me to be a partner. 
So I had lined up financing, et cetera, and I had done the math and I said, well, it's actually really difficult to make money strictly on rental. It's also very difficult to make money strictly on sales of bikes. Most bike shops are only like 3%, 4% profitable. So I basically said, well, if you can rent a bike a bunch of times before you sell it, um, if you like the bike, you could um, take it home. You could keep your rental credit for up to six months to buy a bike, any bike new or used. It was a big, big experiment. Yeah. Ended up being um, really logistically challenging, and we had had that huge amounts of inventory. Yeah. But for two, three years, we pulled it off very well. And then um, I ended up selling it at kind of a, as a miracle, but it worked out really well to the CEO of New Balance. Our big challenge was, I mean, I made a million and two mistakes. There's no way around that, like yeah. literally a million mistakes. Um, but our biggest challenge was just lack of startup capital mm. and managing cash flow. Yeah, so we first. were shipping bikes and used bikes all uh-huh. around the country. Uh-huh. And we were the top dealer in the state for Da Vinci, Felt, Argonne, a whole bunch. A lot of people don't know that. Park yeah. City Bike Demo is this little rental shop in Park City. Yeah. It started in two vans. We were the top dealer in the state. You took a, a, a new approach to selling bikes. Yeah. You... Like you said earlier, you you guys became the top dealer for a bunch of these brands. Mm -hmm. Um, All are kind of out of thin air. A lot of hard work, but you just started it and and were really good at it. We call this the masters of commerce, Mm -hmm. and you you fit that bill. Being a marketing guy, so especially in the bike industry, I, I know that a lot of these brands don't sell direct right you don't sell online yeah there's a number of reasons why yeah but why why do you think that most of these brands aren't selling direct to consumer basically the number one reason is why people don't buy cars online they make their decisions informed by online but actually putting the credit card in is very rare and that's because that last step on a technical thing that costs a lot of money has to happen in person and all these different, or preferably happens. There are flagrant violations that draw a lot of attention, such as Canyon bicycles, Hmm. the largest online seller of bicycles on the planet. Not very popular in the US, but gorgeous bikes. They just launched in the US. They can't keep up with demand. The reason they can't keep up is the virus, of course. Hmm. It's that factor, and then it's, yeah, it's why people don't buy cars online, like literally put their credit card in. And you kind of- You go to a dealer, you need to, feel it, touch right. it, yeah. and a bike is a personal thing. It needs to fit you. There's all sorts of suspension designs and whatever, uh-huh. you know, so there's this human process that's required. These brands that aren't selling online, you know, bikes, bike companies specifically, I feel like spend a ton of money on marketing. When they're not selling online, what is the point of doing all this marketing and sending people to their website if they don't? If they sell can't direct. sell a bike. Yeah. So how do they know if they're doing it right? <laughs> they don't. That, they don't. Yeah, they have no idea. <laughs> so they're and that's the thing with the bike and it's just build all this stuff, get it out there and hope it sells. Pray. And some years it does. And then they have to manage their lead manufacturing lead times two to three years out. Yeah. And all these different things. It's it's a really difficult business for everyone involved. Yesterday it was announced that Specialized was now going to be selling their bikes on Backcountry.com. And, yeah. and, the, and a couple other rules changed with that. So apparently, before then, retailers could not sell their bikes on their own websites. So like right. they could only sell them in shop. They couldn't they couldn't e-tail yeah. complete bikes. They can now. Yeah. Uh, and I just thought that was a really interesting pivot. Right. People need to know, do they have this bike in stock or not? Am I going to drive here? Am I going to drive up to, we're, so we're in Salt Lake City, like Ogden, like an hour away, 45 minutes, because they happen to have that bike in the color I want, in the size I want. Mm-hmm. Is it new or used? Like all those different things. So that was the secret at Park City Bike Demos. We had that. We had live recording of what's the quality, what's the price of this bike, how many days has it been used, if it's mm-hmm. used, things like that. Do you think it would be valuable for these retail shops to have access to the brand's inventory like without having to carry them all on the floor? Because you said a big problem yeah. that you guys had was that you had to buy the bikes. Yeah, well, that's why I'm here, you know, yeah. and that's why I love what you guys do. And you guys meet a very valuable and critical role in the outdoor industry, um, whatever we call it, eco, you know, 
you know, ecosystem. Symbiosis. Yeah, that isn't being met well, in my opinion. Huh. And there's great companies doing what you guys do, but it's just not widespread enough. Yeah. And yes, that is a critical component. I think the one thing is transparency on is it actually at the store mm-hmm. or when will it be there? So, so, you, so something that might have helped you guys is having insight into the brand's inventory. Yeah. And, and that would allow you guys to not have to buy all these bikes and have them there sitting in boxes. Yeah. You could instead have one or a couple of the bikes exactly. and someone could be like, yes, I want this bike. Yeah. And then without having to own that inventory, you could just get it from the brand. Exactly. You wouldn't have to carry all exactly. that inventory. Yeah. So that's a critical component. And yes, if you can plug and play into the brand's inventory and have that on your website as a retailer, huge, Gosh. massive. We've heard this term endless aisle, and it's and, and you were talking about how one of the biggest pain points of Park City Bike Demo is you had to carry so much inventory yep. that sometimes, a lot of the time, like either you had too much or you didn't. What I know is with other shops, sometimes they don't have exactly what someone wants. Yep. This idea of endless aisle is like connecting retailers to brand inventory. Yep. Do you think that would be something that would have been super helpful in the bike industry and in, in your shop? Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's a it's a mixed bag because again, you have to communicate to the consumer: is it there or can it be ordered? For how much and when will it be there? Mm-hmm. And a lot of people would order and choose to pick up at our store because we did because we had our tech expertise. We actually built endless aisle on our ecom platform for a couple providers. You you have to have both basically, yeah. and yeah, so basically. We, you have to maintain the core of what a bike shop is. There's few industries that that is more, not that it, that is critical. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of brands will move to short circuit dealers because you're giving away 30%, 40% of your margins, whatever it is, mm-hmm. to have the dealer support it. Usually at the end of the day with infrastructure, maybe 50%. Mm-hmm. Shipping costs and employees to pack and ship and all this stuff. Yeah. Just to ship it one more time to get it to the dealer and then in turn have them sell it. And, um, but with bike, you have to have that infrastructure Yeah. to sell bikes online is, is a small, is a portion and that bike shops will always need to exist. So it's the Tesla move where yeah. Tesla shut down all their dealers and went online, completely fell on their face and then they reopened them up. So you would, would you say that confidently that look, you can bike. Bike companies, go ahead, sell online, but you have to support yeah. the dealer network. If you don't, it's a foolish move. It's like taking a gun and loading it and shooting yourself in the foot. Because these are the guys who get it the extra mile. Yeah, exactly. A lot of people think the internet is a silver bullet. And in, if you don't do it right, if you don't build your infrastructure, all that, it's literally shooting yourself in the foot. Step one, marketing. You know, banner yeah. ads, video, yeah. things out there, news articles. Step two is where is it? Last part is the transaction. Got to make it available. Yeah. That is a big one as well. Is like you can't send someone to your website after all this marketing and not be able to direct them where to get it. So everyone has to work together. It's like yeah. you got to tie your inventory together with your marketing and be able to yeah. sell it in yeah. the end. Yeah. And, and for bikes, it's it's that relationship is really important yeah whether or not they necessarily buy it from the store uh or online it, it maybe it doesn't matter where yeah. they get it from as long as it's yeah. your your bike so if you're your brand manager or your ceo or whatever at your your president at one of these companies you have to have one you need to understand that perspective two is you have to have a lead marketing and e-com guy who understands that mm-hmm. and then you Part three is there's the human component, which is that that person also has to follow through mm-hmm. and build a system and have support to also follow through and build that entire channel. Gotcha. You know, so it's complex and yeah. it's expensive. And, you know, 10 years ago, seven years ago, you could win at Google search and it was just like shooting fish in a barrel. Yeah. It's completely 180. Yeah. Cost of marketing, effectiveness, signal to the noise of you versus your competitors. It's so expensive, gotcha. you know, and a lot of people are not doing the math to like figure out like, am I winning or not? You yeah. know, I'm putting all this money into Google. Am I winning? Is it, what's it actually doing for me? What's my cost per acquisition? Cost per sale, cost per lead, cost mm-hmm. per engagement, etc. Gotcha. Awesome. 
Hey, man. Thanks yeah. so much. Thank it's you, always Colton, a pleasure always. to talk with you. We're just going to have to do a bike podcast or a, what is it, Lemon? Yeah, the 24 lemon Hours race. of Lemons. We'll do a car show, too. A car show. We'll be the next car talk. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> cool. cool. Thank man. you so Thanks much, Thanks so Colton, much for coming, As man. always.